Hey guys, welcome to my channel where my goal is to look like Mr. Olympia, 100% natural. Okay guys, bodybuilding and steroids, this is the best and most interesting and not surprisingly one of the most controversial subjects you can get into specifically within the bodybuilding and fitness industry. This topic is probably responsible for like 90% of the keyboard warrior comments and arguments I see online, whether it be YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, you know, whenever there's like a natural or supposedly natural 100% natural athlete who puts up a photo or like a progress picture or a workout or a diet tip, whatever. There's always like, out of 500 comments, like 480 of them will be a group of individuals just arguing each other. And oftentimes they fall within like two sides of the spectrum. There's like, you know, the super naive guy, the one who sees someone who's like Ronnie Coleman or something. And he's like, yeah, that's achievable within a couple of years, good nutrition, you know, good hard work, good sleep, good genetics. And you know, they don't know what they're talking about, unfortunately. And then you have guys on the opposite side of the spectrum who are completely cynical. These are the dudes who, you know, everyone knows them. They're the guys out there who like, whatever they weigh, you weigh one pound more, that's it. Your steroids cannot be bigger than them. They just can't accept it in their minds. And then there's, you know, someone who weighs a pound less than them. Bro, do you even live? And even I've had situations like that on my social media posts where someone will come by and be like, you know, nice gains, bro. What bike you on or what, what you're cycling. And then I usually take it as a compliment, you know, pretty much saying like congratulations in a sense that you've achieved the physique, which is at this point considered, you know, at an unnatural level by some. And then I usually tell them, you know, the truth, I'm not taking anything. That is of course, except for creatine, oh snap. But yeah, I am sick and tired of seeing this and probably the underlying issue is that there's a very large misconception or lack of information regarding what is the true natural genetic limit or natural genetic potential attainable for an athlete of, you know, X body structure, X height, X body fat percentage, and you know, X genetic factor. So this is what this video is gonna do. I have scoured the internet, I've done you know the research, I have a pretty good amount of experience in this topic, and I have taken out 95% of the crap, and I have kept the 5% of the crap that actually matters, and that could actually give us a uh, you know, consistent way of telling uh, whether the person is either you know on steroids or that he's just some crazy, magical, insane Harry Potter type shit genetic anomaly. So what's this video gonna do? Number one, we're gonna do a natural definition because the perception that some people have as to what actually is considered natural is different between individuals. Number two, we're gonna look at a frame of comparison and in addition to that, we're actually gonna look at a couple of peer reviewed scientific articles, actual hardcore science, and then we're gonna establish a way of extrapolating based on someone's stats, you know, their height, their weight, their body fat percentage, whatever, whether that person is, you know, in a naturally attainable range. There's a couple calculations out there. We can take it, break it down, do the formula, plot the graph, anyone outside the graph, probably on something, it's that simple. Okay, part one, we're gonna be looking at natural definition. Um, what I'm gonna be taking for the purpose of this video is what's widely considered by many sports, including natural bodybuilding organizations, you know, other big non-bodybuilding related sports, NFL, you know, NBA, the Olympics, whatever, you name it. We're gonna be looking at the World Anti-Doping Agency, or WADA's, they have a prohibited substance list. This list technically can be split up into three different ways. You've got all-time prohibited substance, so you can't take this stuff whenever. Now, five years ago, it doesn't matter. There's in-competition prohibited substances, so, you know, whatever you take yesterday is fine, but you can't take it today, the day of the race, the day of the competition. Particular sports, so what's legal for tennis, uh, may be prohibited in football or basketball or whatever. Also, the concentration of even naturally found substances in your blood may be a prohibited factor. Um, for example, you have Alistair Overeem. He's a popular UFC heavyweight fighter. About a year or two ago, he tested positive for, for performance enhancers, and he was not allowed to compete in one of his fights. And he was found with a free testosterone level, I believe it was 15 to one, one being the natural average, you know, free testosterone level for most men, when the maximum allowable level was six to one. So six to one is already like your testosterone genetically gifted, holy crap. So if you're found with 15 to one, that's three times the maximum genetically gifted level yeah, you're probably on something. I'm gonna throw this prohibited list in a link down below. And one other thing I wanna mention is that when people say steroids, they're kind of missing out on other things which be technically considered performance enhancing in other sports and specifically related to bodybuilding. For example, things that get you like shredded, like diuretics or clenbuterol, I don't recall that that's actually a steroid, meaning a synthetic, uh, you know, natural hormone or, you know, derivative of testosterone. Things such as insulin, 
would not be loved in the same group as testosterone. Things such as human growth hormone used by like, you know, the crazy huge IFBB pro bodybuilders, same story. So you can't just say steroids, you have to say there's a larger cloud of performance enhancing things. It's something that's really popular in the, in the physique, you know, aesthetics industry, uh, such as clenbuterol is more, you know, and more to get you shredded, not necessarily for you to grow. Although it's used in conjunction with growth growth substances. Okay, actually getting into a couple models which can predict and extrapolate what is the maximum size that an individual can get to uh, from natural means. You've got things like the McDonald model, the Alan Aragon model, Casey Butts frame size model, that's a very popular one because unlike the previous examples, this one takes into consideration your bone structure, which is very important because someone, for example, with seven inch wrist is probably gonna be able to put on more muscle. He's got a bigger structure, more to work with than someone with six inch wrists. But the one that we're gonna be using mostly for the purposes of this video is the FFMI, similar to the BMI. This is the fat free muscle index. This is a very simple calculation you can do you know, you can put in a couple of your stats and uh, this can essentially give you a score which we can then compare to other athletes, both natural and not natural, to establish an essential maximum genetic potential score for, you know, the best of the best athletes who are natural. This FFMI calculation was derived from an article published in 1995 in the Clinical Journal of Sports Medicine, so you know it's hardcore science. It looked at 157 athletes, 83 drug users, and 74 non-users, and compared it to the statistics of, you know, like stats, body weight, height, whatever, given by 20 Mr. America winners from the pre-steroid era. Now, what I mean by that is we're talking about the 30s, 40s, early 50s, uh, you know, the Mr. Universe competition. This is way before the, you know, the golden era of bodybuilding with Arnold, Sergio Oliva, even Larry Scott, the first Mr. Olympia way back in 1965 openly talked about steroids. I mean, it was very simple back then. Diana Ball was like, you know, popping Mentos or gum or something. It was simple, it was cheap, it was definitely effective. It was discussed openly. I mean, anyone that was asked, says, you take steroids? Says, yeah, I take three Diana Ball a day. Or someone else would say, I would take this, 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 and that. It was not an illegal thing. So yeah, you gotta go a little bit further back, but even then you're not 100% sure that these athletes were not you know, accessible to steroids. We'll talk about that later in the video. So the average FFMI of these 20 Mr. America you know, winners, which was considered to be at the time the genetic elite natural best body that you can get was about 25.4. So this 25 to 26, you know, if you want to be a little bit more, more liberal, um, this range is essentially the maximum FFMI that you can have for an already genetically gifted, perfect diet, perfect nutrition, Athlete. Anyone above this, you know, by a significant range, you can re realistically assume that they are on some kind of performance enhancing compound or substance. Um, again, if you're going to be looking at someone with a 28, 29, there's a higher chance. Someone like Ronnie Coleman, if you put in his stats from when he won one of his Mr. Olympias, he got an FFMI of 42. So that's crazy. And you know, he's obviously on something. Interesting fact, the average male has an FFMI of 19. So anywhere in that 19 to 25 range is considered, you know, you can pretty much get a score of how much you look like you lift. Where 25 is essentially the maximum that you can achieve from a natural standpoint. Okay guys, before I get any deeper, I wanna talk about why I use an average FFMI of 25 as the maximum natural genetic barrier. Well, the average FFMI of the natural group was 21.8, meaning these guys are obviously bodybuilders. They have a decent amount of physical development over the average man who has a score of 19. Well, interestingly enough, the steroid group had an average FFMI of 24.8. So you may be asking yourself, why am I using 25 as the natural genetic barrier? when the average steroid user in this group couldn't even break that themselves. Well, it's because one individual who was confirmed to be natural in the study of 156 was actually able to break 25 FFMI. So if you're gonna have such a small sample size and one person can actually do that, you can bet that in the hundreds of thousands or even millions of natural bodybuilding competitors and Instagram celebrity and YouTube fitness personalities out there, in such a huge sample size that you're definitely gonna have a considerable amount of individuals who can break that themselves. Because remember, from a genetic standpoint, we are dealing with the best of the best. I mean, these guys are competing at the Mr. Olympia. These guys have physiques which are admired by hundreds of thousands or millions of people out there. So it's fair to assume that we're going to have some decent data outliers. Be that as it may, we are not naive. If someone is having an FFMI score of 28, 29, or 30, no matter how big of a sample size you're going to have, that's not a data outlier. That's friggin' magic. You're a wizard, Harry. I'm all natural. <laughs> Okay, so I've gone up ahead and graphed an example of individual's lean and competition weights at an FFMI of 25, once again, assuming the best possible diet, exercise, and genetic standpoint. The top line represents lean weight at about 10% body fat, whereas the bottom red line represents competition weight. We're talking about shredded 5% body fat. So you can take an individual, for example, someone at six feet tall, and you can plot them on the line. 
uh, according to the red line, at 5% body fat, the most they could weigh is 190 pounds. Since we're assuming an FFMI of 25, that's pretty much the best they could possibly be. If they were to get to 190 pounds, they must have worked their ass off to get there. If you were to plot someone at that same body height and they were getting 198 pounds, most likely they are on some kind of performance enhancing substance. So running through myself, for example, at six feet tall male with an FFMI of 25, again, I'm nowhere near that, but you know, essentially that is a goal that I could work towards. At 5% body fat, I would have a body weight of 191 pounds. Me weighing about 183 at, you know, at a higher body fat percentage, there's still a lot, you know, room to grow for me to achieve this ideal genetic potential physique. Now some of you guys may be thinking like, damn, 191 pounds at 5%, that's shredded contest level at six feet. That is a big guy. I mean, we're talking like, you know, we're talking pretty close to the old school bodybuilding days in the current uh, men's physique Olympia caliber athletes. And you know, some of those guys are on something. Taking a different approach, you've got the popular website, Natty or Not. You guys can find a link below. Um, this one also lists, you know, an extrapolated list of, you know, associated the maximum body weight that you can have in X percent, X body fat percentage at the different heights. It lists six feet tall at 5% body fat. The maximum body weight an individual could have naturally is 184 pounds. So you may be asking yourself like, you know, why is there a bit of a difference considering the other one was based on a reasonable scientific article. Um, why is there that difference of seven pounds? Seven pounds of muscle is a pretty big range. You put that on a person, you know, that's, that's a considerable size difference. And I believe that's a key issue or source of error found in this article considering the FFMI calculation. Even though it's a pretty good statistical concept that you can take and you know, I think it's fairly accurate, there are issues because that 1939 to 1959, you know, 20 Mr. America AAU winners that they looked at, realistically you can't be 100% sure that they were on they, that they were not on some type of gear. And to explain what I mean by that, we're actually going to dive a little bit into the histories of steroids. Um, it came out in the 1930s. In fact, there was actually rumors about the Nazis using them, you know, experimenting on their soldiers in World War II. Uh, it made its way into athletics in the 1950s, first being used by the Soviet uh, Olympic team, and then to, you know, they made its way to the Americans. Uh, by the 1960s, it was all over the West Coast bodybuilding scene. You know, well, there's, there has never been a Mr. Olympia uh, caliber athlete who has not been on some kind of gear. Okay guys, let's get into a couple examples of these old school bodybuilders who may be skewing the standards up a bit because definitely at an FFMI of 25, which is supposedly the natural barrier, 190 pounds at 6 feet tall, 5% body fat is pretty damn shredded and crazy. Okay, so we got Steve Reeves, 6 foot 1, 215 pounds. He was one of the first classic uh, aesthetic physiques, Mr. Universe 1950 and AAU Mr. America 1947. Definitely one of the more uh, pretty and aesthetic physiques. Uh, of the golden era and a physique which even today stands up to the highest degree of scrutiny. Reg Park competing from 1946 to 1973 with wins like the Mr. Universe in 1951, 58, 65 and big lifts like a 500 pound bench press, 605 squat, uh, standing 6 feet 1 at 220 pounds at a reasonable body fat percentage. None of, the, none of these guys were ever too lean. Um, that wasn't really much of a requirement as opposed to these days where if you're on stage, you know, even 1% above 5% body fat, you're considered fat, unconditioned, out of shape. Uh, so again, standing 220 pounds, he actually stood next to Arnold and held his own. So also in addition, because of he competed for so long, almost a 30 year span, you're not sure whether he, you know, possibly experimented with anabolics or not and whether or not, uh, this study took him into consideration uh, if it took him earlier in his career versus later in his career after he potentially experimented with anabolics, that would skew the standards up a bit. John Grimmick, five foot nine, hundred ninety five pounds. Obviously, once again, not anywhere near today's conditioning standards. Nineteen forty, Mr. America. Nineteen forty eight, Mr. Universe. And it was confirmed that nineteen fifty four, he experimented with anabolics. So, depending on when this study took him, was it before, or after experimenting with steroids, uh, would potentially skew or not skew the standards up. But to be honest, guys, the only way you can be 100% sure you're looking at a natural athlete would be to look at Eugene Sandow, uh, active in the 1800s, way before steroids were even invented. He's the father of current bodybuilding, along with Joe Weider and Arnold, pretty much made it what it is today. Um, he's obviously natural, standing 5'9", 180 pounds, an impressive physique for his time, nonetheless. 
Now, I know that some of you guys may be saying, you know, wait a minute, how could you compare athletes from 40, 50, 60 years ago to athletes nowadays from a physical development standpoint, considering that so many things have changed regarding training, you know, better equipment, better knowledge uh, regarding supplementation. Obviously, they didn't have like, you know, BCAs, creatine, protein powders back then. And I have to say, yes, that's true, but I don't think that that's going to result in such a vast difference, you know, allowing people to take their body from a physical standpoint that much higher. Do you really think that training has changed that much? I mean, bench press, squat, that lift the three compound staples that's how, that, that's always been around you know essentially we've always understood that protein is the key building block of muscle whether you have whey protein or you know you have casein yes it may make things easier but I'm sure that that was an issue back then you can just get it from milk eggs tuna fish chicken sources, whatever. So I think overall this difference in time is somewhat negligible. I mean, a squat is still a squat, a gram of protein is still a gram of protein, a calorie is still a calorie. The core fundamentals of bodybuilding and physical development have not changed. So that's it guys. I mean, the numbers pretty much speak for themselves. If there's an athlete and you find yourself questioning or getting into a debate or something as to whether they are indeed natural or potentially natural, put their, put their numbers, put their stats into this calculation. Again, link below. You know, if you get a if you get an output of 30, bro, who are you kidding? Come on. And if you get, on the other hand, if you get an output of 22 or 23, they could realistically, very reasonably, be a natural athlete. Um, only when they're in that 24 to 26 range does it get a bit into a gray area because realistically, they could just be really, really awesome natural, or they could just be a kind of crappy guy on gear. Okay guys, keep an eye out for my second video, the Natty Debate Part 2. We're gonna get controversial because we're gonna look at actual fitness, you know, natural fitness examples or idols in the fitness industry, and we're gonna extrapolate based on what we learned in this video, whether that athlete is natural or not, or you know, whether they're in that gray area. I'm talking Steve Cook, Matt Ogus, Tosh Twins, Simeon Panda, Jeff Side. I know that's a popular one that everyone loves to argue about, and we're gonna dive right in. Okay guys, so at the end of the day, these are just my opinions. I've introduced some data into the mix, a little bit of science, and that's great, but realistically there are data anomalies there are significant genetic outliers you're gonna have to essentially take what I say with a grain of salt or tell me to go screw myself and that's up to you as the viewer